I'm here today with Jennifer Garcia Bashaw, author of a new book titled Scapegoats, The Gospel Through the Eyes of Victims from Fortress Press. There it is. Uh, Jennifer teaches New Testament and Christian ministry at Campbell University in North Carolina. She received her BA from Baylor University, her MDiv from Truett Theological Seminary, and a PhD in New Testament from Fuller Theological Seminary. Jennifer is an ordained American Baptist minister and has served in churches across the United States for the last 20 years. She has a passion for teaching the Bible and for training and supporting pastors. Her research and writing spans several fields, gospel studies, Girardian inter interpretation, hermeneutics, homiletics, and practical theology. You can follow Jennifer on Twitter at Garcia Bashaw. That's G-A-R-C-I-A-B-A-S-H-A-W. So Jennifer, welcome. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Well, same here. Um, you know, as I was mentioning to Jennifer earlier, when I heard the title of this book, I said, okay, well, I've got to get this and read this book and, you know, talk to the author because it's right in the same area that I've been, you know, trying to focus a lot of my efforts as well. <clears throat> so, um, so congratulations on the new book. Um, okay. But before, you know, we get into that, maybe we could start by having you tell us something that you would want people to know about you that I didn't cover. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I actually grew up um, mostly in Texas in Southern Baptist churches. Um, so I have that sort of history, but then I also grew up in um, a Mexican-American family. And so there's a lot of uh, sort of clashing that happens with my background. Um, but I was called into ministry um, at a pretty young age, but in a Southern Baptist context. That means um, if you're a woman, <laughs> there are very limited options for you. And so I did go to seminary. Um, and when I figured out it was going to be a really tough battle to become a pastor, um, my seminary professors encouraged me to go on in my education and teach. And so I did that. But I've always had um, that desire to um, serve in the church. And so I have throughout my life served in the church, but my career now uh, is teaching. And so I love to be able to have both of those, those um, aspects to be able to teach, but also to serve um, in churches and preach and all those things. So I, I guess that's what you need to know about me. <laughs> well, I can really see how those, you know, two avenues would reinforce each other heavily. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a great tie in there. <clears throat> so. Um, Let's talk about the new book. As I mentioned, the title is Scapegoats, the Gospel Through the Eyes of Victims. So what motivated you to write that book? Well, I actually studied Rene Girard, um, who is the, the sort of genius behind the scapegoat theory, um, in my PhD. So in my dissertation, I, I read a lot by him and used him, but I didn't end up publishing my dissertation because it didn't feel sort of practical enough or helpful enough to the normal everyday churchgoer. Um, and so I kind of put writing aside for a bit and I was teaching and, you know, lots of new classes every semester. And so I focused on that. But um, in the last three or four years, um, I've noticed that Christians um, have been showing up in the world in a way that doesn't seem to look like Jesus. And so I started thinking about like what, what, what factors are involved here. Um, and I think one of the factors is that they um, are not reading the gospels and understanding Jesus's life and ministry and teaching teachings. And so I said, well, how can I um, give people, especially in the church, people in the pews, um, tools to be able to read Jesus well, um, to look at the gospels and, and figure out how to um, interpret them in our context. And so I thought, okay, I think I can put the two things together, Gerard um, and reading the gospels well, um, and, and give some people uh, help in reading and understanding the gospels. And so that's why I decided to do it um, and trying to um, really give people tools um, to read well. And then it kind of spooled into other things. Like I started looking at the history of the church um, and how the church has been misreading Jesus for a long time <laughs> and has been creating scapegoats for a long time. And so it kind of, the project kind of grew. Um, so now I'm, you know, uh, what I'm trying to do in the book is uh, teach people how to read the gospels well, give them an introduction to Rene Girard, 
um, and also help people understand our history as a church so that we can see um, what the mistakes that we've made so we can move forward in a better way. Well, I, I thought that that was very helpful. And, um, you know, relative to Rene Girard, I mean, I heard of him a couple of years ago, but it seems like more recently there's been a few different books that have, you know, taken different tacks than what you have specifically, but, you know, all based on his, uh, you know, theory is of mimesis. Is that I, mm-hmm. mimetics, mimesis, com- mm-hmm. you know, competition is, is, is more of the, you know, <laughs> layperson term that I think of it as, you know, and, and, yes. and how, you know, mimicking, <clears throat> copying, competition has overwhelmed yeah. a lot of our values. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so, um, and obviously he points out time and time again, as, as you have too, that we use scapegoats, you know, as a right. offering, you know, as a way to push the blame onto somebody else instead of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, I like the way that you demonstrated how that has played out, you know, within the realm of Christianity specifically um, for centuries, mm-hmm. <laughs> unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so who would you say the book is most intended for? Well, I, I intended to write it on a church level so people who are in the pews can pick it up and read it. And I realized as I got um, further into it, it that Gerard is difficult. <laughs> He's difficult to grasp. There's so many parts of his theory, right? So it, 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 even just the subject matter is a little higher than maybe the regular um, churchgoer would be used to. Um, and also I wanted to bring in academic scholarship because the academic scholarship of the Bible doesn't seem to trickle down very well to the pews um, in many churches. And so I wanted to do that. And so I tried my best <laughs> to hit at a church level. And I think it it does in, in some places. But people in the pews are not used to reading the Bible in, in such detail, like studying it with from a literary perspective. And so I think some of those things may be foreign um, unfamiliar to people in the in the pews, and so they may um, be challenged a little bit. Uh, I, so I've done a couple of book groups with people um, reading my book, and I've I've realized that probably the the level that it's at, who I'm writing to, is pastors. Mm. Um, I mean, they, I definitely had pastors in my mind because I wanted to give them um, ideas and tools to be able to talk to their congregation about these things. Um, and so I had a pastors group, and it really seemed to hit right there for them. Um, they are used to reading um, theological things, and so um, I think it hit that audience really well. But that doesn't mean that people in the church can't read it. Um, it's just uh, dif- different from what they're probably used to reading, I guess. Well, I mean, for what it's worth, I mean, I'm not a pastor. I don't have any kind of theological training whatsoever. I thought it was great. I mean, I thought oh, it was very accessible, uh, you know, and, and I like annotations, you know, and footnotes and things like that, because basically it just adds strength to an argument, right? It shows the background that backs up whatever the point is that you're trying to make. So it's like, I don't see anything wrong with that. Good. I'm glad some (laughs) people are intimidated by footnotes, I think. (laughs) Yeah, which I think is, I don't know, nonsensical, but whatever. Um, But I noticed, you know, it is published by Fortress Press, right? And Fortress Press used to be both academic books and trade books. And a couple of years ago, they separated out, you know, quote unquote, their trade book group to be called broadleaf books. Right. And so this, but your book is, is, is published through Fortress. I mean, and mm-hmm. I, I assume that was a conscious decision, you know, to go that route. Yeah. And there's also another branch of Fortress that's more academic. So where ah. the branch that I'm in right now is sort of in the middle. So What's there's, the the, like, I think it's Lexington. Oh, I didn't even familiar with that. So that's, that's like high I academic work. Ah. And then Fortress is sort of, you'll see both. Hmm. And then Broadleaf is more popular. Um, and so I think I hit at the right spot there. Interesting. Um, but I would, I mean, I think uh, I would like to get it in the hands of more people. So Broadleaf would have been good too, I think. So um, let's talk about how the book was organized. There's three sections to it. Um, starting with the uh, scapegoating of women and then the poor and infirm, you know, health wise, and then ending with outsiders kind of generally speaking. Um, why did you decide to organize it that way? 
Yeah, I really struggled over this um, because I knew I also wanted to be able to reach people maybe that were still in the evangelical world. Uh, maybe we're moving um, more to the left, um, maybe asking questions. Um, and so I had to be a little careful um, because I think what ends up happening is some of the verbiage um, in progressive Christianity really automatically turns people off in the evangelical world because they've been sort of conditioned to be scared of uh, words like feminist and they don't probably know the word womanist, <laughs> but some of the concepts, liberation, uh, social justice, those sort of words have been um, painted in a negative light in the evangelical world. And so I, I try to think about how I could work people up to the concepts that maybe they have a lot of bias about already. So I started with women because I think it's an easy thing to note throughout history. And most people will say, well, yes, women should not be scapegoated. I can see how it's been done throughout history and um, I understand and I can move forward with that. So I started maybe with the easier one to recognize, right? It's easy to recognize women being scapegoated. It, it's hard to change because we have been in patriarchal society for so long, but easier to recognize. Um, and so then I moved and I put the poor and the firm together because the way the church has treated um, people with, with sickness and disability and poor people throughout history, um, it parallels each other. So I put those two together, but then I, I ended with the outsiders because um, there's so many things going on in our society today um, where outsiders are being scapegoated and we American Christians will not admit it, <laughs> right? If it's immigrants, if it's Black Americans, um, whatever, um, it's harder for them to admit. And so I wanted to get them used to the idea of what scapegoating looks like. So when we hit, especially the chapter on the Black scapegoat, that they're ready to understand and to admit it because so many people have been pushing against that um, that history of America um, and the way that American Christians especially have treated Black Americans. Um, so yeah, I had a I had a um, plan, <laughs> and I, hopefully it it, it works. Um, but it, sometimes you have to walk with people when they they want to change need to change their mind about things. You have to walk with them um, and take it slowly and not just dump things on them that will be. Um, too foreign for them. I think that progression makes a lot of sense. I can see why you know you would orient it that way. But, um, so you did include you know a chapter about the scapegoat of Black Americans, and you know that's obviously a tough topic. Uh, and you're not a Black American yourself, right? So those of us right. who are not always you know um, run the risk of appropriation or you know whatever. Um, mm -hmm. How did you approach that? Yeah, so I read as much as I could uh, from Black Americans, Black theologians, Black ethicists, um, and, and got a feel for what um, what is being said today, especially when, uh, regarding Christianity. And, and then I decided I am going to try only to quote um, from, from Black writers and um, try to keep my voice out of it a little bit more. Like I, I pet put my voice throughout the book. You know, I had these like first person narratives that I use, like sermons that I preach, um, but I, I did not do that in the, that chapter. Um, instead, I tried to put forth the voices of the black writers um, that had been helpful in me understanding American history and Christians um, and racism. And so I tried to put their voices um, front and center in that chapter. Um, and, and it was hard. And, and I was writing the chapter in the summer of 2020. Um, so right after the mm. murders of George Floyd wow. and Ahmaud Arbery, I mean, Breonna Taylor. And so it was also really emotional for me. Mm. I think maybe if you're reading through and you get to that chapter, you might notice like a change in tone mm. um, as well. It's like an urgency um, that I felt when I was writing it. Um, so it was a challenge, but I think it, um, it might be the most important chapter in the book. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got this very polarized, <clears throat> you know, society these days, um, tribalism, biases, things that have kind of grown substantially, at least for my lifetime, it feels like. Um, what do you think, you know, the answer is? Um, 
how do we get past the us versus them? Right. We, well, like I say in the chapter, we have to recognize and repent from the things that we have done and are and Americans, American Christians, white American Christians have participated in in history. So we have to recognize it. Um, we have to repent of it. And that's hard for a lot of people because they want to say, well, I was not involved in that. That, my, that was my ancestors or whatever. But we have to um, say those words aloud and acknowledge the pain um, that is in our history, especially for black Americans. Um, but then we have to listen after that. We have to listen to the voices um, of the black artists and the black theologi theologians and the black writers. We have to listen to them. Um, but not make them fix the problem, right? I think that's what a lot of people do. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a lot and I'm gonna listen to Black Americans and tell me what I need to change. You know, we can't put the onus on them <laughs> to tell us how to change. We have to read and then we have to change um, ourselves. Um, I I think the moving forward in the church. I think one of the most important groups that I think can take the church um, out of this polarization um, is actually black women. Um, womanist theology and the ideas behind womanist um, hermeneutics and readings of scripture um, are so, to me, Jesus-centered. They, they, they read scripture the way um, Jesus lived. And so I think that is the future. Uh, the hard part is they are not getting a voice in America right now. I mean, people in the church don't even know what womanist theology is. Um, but basically, these black women are reading the Bible through their own experience. And what they're coming out with is that um, the Bible speaks liberation for all people, not just for black women. Like they're not thinking about just themselves. They're thinking about all people. And so that I think is a good way forward. Um, but we have to get people to listen and put those interpretations into practice. I mean, because of my work with, in particular with publishing of color, I work with a lot of African-American women, you know, in that venue. And I really do get a sense of what you're saying and, mm -hmm. and the sense of kind of like the caring, yeah. you know, I hate to use the word love, but I mean, I would say that, you know, I mean, that they've really got a deep sense of that. Yeah. Um, and, those who can convey that well, it's mm -hmm. very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's compassion too, um, compassion for all people. And that's why it reminds me of the way Jesus lived his life. Um, and so to listen to them, to read um, African-American women, it, it gets us closer to, I think, what the gospels were trying to communicate about Jesus's life. Um, so yeah, I would love for that to be the way forward. We just have to get that message out there to, to churches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So kind of getting back to your book, I mean, what would you say is like the most important thing you want people to take away from it? Mm. I, w I don't know if I can say one thing, <laughs> but <laughs> That's okay. um, I, I will say I, I want them to recognize the history, um, the history of the church and how church the, the church has scapegoated people, has continued to marginalize the people that are on um, already on the edges of society. And if we can acknowledge our history, then we can recognize it when we we start doing it again. Um, so for them to, to for our, my readers to recognize our history is one. Um, I want them to read the Gospels better. Um, what I try to do is is good practice for gospel interpretation and stay within one gospel at a time. Like I looked at Matthew and we talked about what's happening in Matthew. I looked at Luke. Um, and when we take them separately like that, I think we get a much deeper um, and fuller picture of Jesus's ministry and Jesus's life. And so I'd like for them to um, learn good hermeneutics <laughs> about the gospels. Um, but then I also hope that they can admit that our reader, my readers can admit what, where they are participating in or complicit in scapegoating in society. Like what kind of groups are they involved in um, that might continue to scapegoat women, um, that might continue to scapegoat immigrants, right? To recognize what's going on around them and their part in it um, because we have to admit those things first before change can happen. Yeah, it's not like all of this is a solved problem. Right. I mean, you know, whether it's scapegoating or biases or discrimination, I mean, it's not just previous generations. 
that are guilty of that. Um, so, you know, to the extent that your book can help shed a light on that aspect of it, I think it's very important. Um, so I know you're in the midst of launching this great new book, but is there anything in the future that you're able to talk about in terms of projects, books, whatever? Yeah. So I, um, I do some work with the Bible for Normal People podcast. Hmm. I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with it. Yeah, sure. But, um, trying to make biblical scholarship accessible to just regular people. Um, and so I'm writing a commentary for them. Hmm. They've, they've put out a couple of commentaries, uh, Genesis for Normal People, Exodus for Normal People, Jonah for Normal People. And so I'm writing the John, Gospel of John for Normal People commentary right now. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, hopefully it'll be done and available in 2023 but that's what i'm working on and it's it's fun um to take all of this scholarship that i have access to and try to distill it down um so that anybody can just pick it up and and start to understand um, more things about the gospels and about particularly the gospel of john Hmm, interesting well cool let me know when that comes out we'll have a chat about that as well (laughs) so again the new book um is scapegoats the gospel through the eyes of victims and you can learn more about it at fortresspress.com um jennifer thanks so much for this great piece of work and for uh, joining us today to talk about it Mm -hmm. thank you so much for inviting me